other chapters, we're really going to deal with this, but this, in my opinion, right here is the perfect place to at least see it. All right? Uh, verse 6. Okay, now, now uh, look over in verse 18, same chapter, 1 Corinthians 4. Now, some of you are puffed up. Okay, verse 19, the last part. Uh, not know the speech of them who are puffed up, but the power. <clears throat> um, and then draw, go all the way into chapter 5, which is only a few verses down, verse 2. And ye are puffed up. All right, so we've got one, two, three, four examples. And I don't know what it, what it looks like in your Bible, not that it matters. But in my Bible, it's like all right in here. <laughs> I mean, it's like I, I've just made a little circle around each puffed up and drew a line to the next one. And uh, I'm in a circle around the next one, a line to that to the next one. <clears throat> and it's all, well, it's all puffed up right there. <clears throat> And um, um, I wanted to start with that because we are going to get a little more into chapter 5. Um, but there is this reality of the wisdom of God which relates to Christ crucified, which relates to uh, being God and yet not fighting for position. And in fact, not only not fighting for position, but recognizing, and I'll just say it, that life comes out of death. And that that's a God thing. Not just a God-ordained thing. And I hope you can hear the difference. Not just a God-ordained thing. It's a God thing. It's who He is. It is the way that he is. And it wasn't just a thing where God sat around one day and said, hey, let's do something different. <laughs> you know, he's not doing something different. He's doing what's him. <clears throat> and that is, he's selfless. He's selfless. It also is that he believes that life comes out of death. And the wisdom of God is... Um, that instead of exalting yourself, being puffed up, <clears throat> it is uh, what we've seen in this fourth chapter where Paul describes the Corinthians that, by the way, he's referring to all these puffed ups, and this isn't even all of them in this one book. He's referring all of these to the Corinthians who, if you remember, um, <clears throat> um, he says... Um, now you are full, now you're rich, you have reigned as kings on your throne. Um, but then he, ta he starts talking about him and the people that follow him, which are their leaders. He's the, one, he's the founder. He's the one God used to found that church and therefore the, brought those people into the kingdom of God. And he begins to describe him and those that work with him as being appointed to death so that they could have life, as um, <clears throat> being made a spectacle and, the de and then describing the death as being made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. And uh, <clears throat> we are fools for Christ's sake, but you're wise, see. And part of that <clears throat> contrast there is because they're puffed up. They want to be wise. They want to be exalted. They want to be great. They want to be this and that. And Paul has already spent the first three chapters describing Christ crucified as the wisdom of God and as the power of God. And now in this fourth chapter, he has literally shown the contrast of him and them and, so, and is showing forth what he considers God-ordained ministry. And that is all these things that, that he describes here. Um, uh, we are weak, but you're strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor working with our hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure it. Being defamed, we entreat it. We are made as 
And my, tr my little translation of this, it says, we, uh, the King James says, we're made of the filth of the world and the offscouring of all things under this day. I said, we are made as the trash cans of the world for everybody to throw their garbage at us, you know. <clears throat> and, um, and he's, you know, basically saying, you know, look, I'm not writing these things to condemn you. This isn't about condemnation. This is, this is who we are. This is what Christ crucified is. This is an example of following Christ crucified. And so, um, so, that, so then he really gets into the puffed up thing. Okay, immediately following that, that's when he gets into, you know, a bunch of times, you know, talking about him being puffed up. Okay, so uh, obviously, always keep your place there. But I'd like for you to turn with me to John 12, 24. I'm sorry, John 12. <clears throat> I was going to say, John 12, what verse do you think we're going to? John 12, verse 12. <laughs> it was a setup, wasn't it? <laughs> John 12, verse 12. <clears throat> All right, up to, up to this point where we're about to read, <clears throat> Jesus and the disciples have been traveling around. They've been blessing. They've been healing. They've been doing deliverance. They've been getting everybody free, doing all this great stuff going on. And the event that happened just prior to this was he raised Lazarus from the dead. Okay? So now, right after that, and, and it's not obvious, so we're going to have to read this, but I want you to show, I want you to see a new surge, an, uh, an upswelling of, uh, for lack of a better word, exaltation, greatness towards the Lord, based primarily on raising Lazarus from the dead. Okay? So, verse 12, on the next day, okay, so that didn't take long. <clears throat> on the next day, many people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, okay, so they're getting all excited because Jesus is coming to the, to, to the feast. Okay. Now, I have to tell you, before this time, there hadn't been a lot of excitement about Jesus coming to the feast. You know, the, the, even his own brothers made fun of him about going, you know, and the, he held back and then went later, you know. Um, but there's a reason why they're excited, and guess what? There's a reason why they took branches and palm trees and all this. Because read it, it's, it's actually still one sentence. And took branches of palms and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now drop down to verse 17 so we can actually see the reason for this. <clears throat> verse 17. The people, therefore, that were with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this cause the people also met him, for they heard that Jesus had done this miracle. Do you see it? Clearly, they're all real excited now. It's like last year was sort of some believed and some didn't, and you know what I mean. You remember it was, <laughs> but this year, and Jesus's timing is perfect. If you want to get famous, he did it just before the feast. <laughs> Except for, we know Jesus's motivation, and he's not thinking of getting famous. <clears throat> so all of this what we would call in Texas, hoop de doo <laughs> is going on. And everybody, you know, they're, oh, Hosanna to the king, and all of this stuff now. And they're calling him king, and they're all following. The whole of Jerusalem is coming out and going, yeah, you're the man, you're the one, he's number one, and we are following him. And, you know, because he does great things, and he's raised Lazarus from the dead. <clears throat> all right, so... Now let's read verse 19, right after verse 18, about the, for this cause also met him the people and they heard what he had done. Verse 19, the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, perceive you how you prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. Y'all see that first little girl there? She received Jesus just 
happy a day ago, and she got Jesus in her heart. <laughs> All right. So, so uh, now you do know where a storm comes from, don't you? Just meteorologically. I'm sure that you do. It's when cold air and warm air meet and it causes a storm. <clears throat> well, folks, that's just a physical manifestation of a spiritual truth. When the wisdom of God and the wisdom of man meet together, there's a crisis. Okay? And, and <clears throat> what has happened, though, is uh, in, in this case, <clears throat> it is not even the contrast of the wisdom of God and the wisdom of man meeting, it is the in, and we'll see the, both of them here in a minute, but at this stage, it is the inbuilt problem of the wisdom of the world or the wisdom of man or the wisdom of this age. And that is everybody wants to be great and nobody wants anybody to be greater than them. Okay. All right. So, so here's what's happening. Jesus is coming to the feast. Everybody, when they hear Jesus is coming to the feast, they're rushing there and they want to see him. And as soon as they see him, they're grabbing palm branches and yelling Hosanna to the king, not because some great revelation hit them of Jesus, but because he raised Lazarus from the dead. And this is a great thing. And this is nobody really, you know, you can't say nobody's ever done that before because Elijah, Elisha did it and, <clears throat> and Elijah. But nonetheless, you know, it's just like, oh my God, this is so wonderful. So they're, they're exalting him and Hosanna to the king and all this stuff. And verse 19 says, and the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, perceive ye how you prevail nothing. Behold the world is gone after him. I want you to know that that little phrase is an ominous phrase. <laughs> the Pharisees saying that are not happy about that. <clears throat> in fact, they are the people in position. They are the exalted people. They are the people. They are the people who have gained the um, <clears throat> the heights of what the wisdom of this world will give you. Um, position, power, prestige, and all of the P's of the world. Position, power, and prestige. Uh, and peppermint. And so they're upset. And this right here, this what? Starts the, 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 the uh, storm. This act of Jesus being exalted is messing with them, okay? <clears throat> now, that, honestly, at this stage, and Jesus has never, you know, at, at this stage, has never done anything to unexalt them, <laughs> you know? I mean, can't, can't we all just be exalted together <laughs> or something like that? <laughs> but no. All right. So I want you to see that, that this uh, new prestige that Jesus has received is causing all kind of movement. This, this new foray into the wisdom of this world has released several different things. Number one, it's released the people to start exalting and, and doing all this stuff and, and seeing him other than he has presented himself. Can I get amen? amen? Jesus has come. Even this, he comes lowly on a, you know, he's fulfilling the scripture, coming lowly on a donkey, but they're all exalting him. Okay? Secondly, it's caused the, the storm clouds to start moving into thunder clouds as far as the Pharisees. This has set them off, and this is the beginning of the end because they're going to they're gonna want to kill him. Okay, all right. And then it's also released something else. And you see that, um, well, 
Let's go ahead and cover one more base. Verse 20, and there were certain Greeks among them that came to worship Jesus, and, and they came. These Greeks now are coming to see Jesus, so it's not just the Jews. And they said, sir, we would see Jesus. And this is an honorable, exalting, you know, as I've often said when I've read these scriptures, the disciples are excited. Man, we're starting to get the Gentiles on our side, too. We're getting a big following here. <clears throat> All right, and it's at that point... Uh, verse 22, Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and Andrew and Philip tell Jesus that, you know, all this is happening. And I wonder if, if what they told him wasn't just that these Gentiles said, sir, we would see Jesus, but maybe they've heard something about the Pharisees and their deal. Maybe they've noticed this great uprising of people exalting, and they come and they tell Jesus, <clears throat> and Jesus answered them, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Well, we know the next verse is John 12, 24, and talks about the, his death, right? Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. But I want you to take note of something. Jesus answered them and said, the hour is come that I'm going to go to the cross. All right. He chose that moment to say it. He chose that moment because that moment was the height of his earthly glory. The wisdom of God. The wisdom of God as seen in weakness, as seen at the cross as seen in powerlessness, the power of God as seen in weakness, in self-giving. And Jesus functions by the wisdom of God. So when all of this, I mean, he's looking at this whole thing. He's looking at these people exalting him here. He's looking at the Gentiles coming here. He's looking at all of this. Uh, they're, they're Hosanna to the king and uproar in Jerusalem. And at that moment, he chooses the cross. If you understand, he'd already chosen the cross. But I'm, what I'm trying to say is that that moment, everything changed for Jesus. It was no longer about ministry or anything else <clears throat> because he is self-giving, because he is not self-exalting, because he believes in life out of death. Okay? And he doesn't believe that all of this going on is anything okay now I mean I know we can look at this and but can you see that can you see in a situation where everybody's going oh you're great and wonderful and oh this is a great ministry and everything oh, you better watch out you know and I'm not you know, I'm not advocating don't get popular or whatever I'm not I, I would like a little of it myself Well, I'm popular just with the wrong crowd. <clears throat> <clears throat> but um, Jesus understands this is a good point to show people who I am, what I'm made of, what the kingdom of God is, and at that point he turns. Okay, <clears throat> now that's all clear and that's good. All right, <clears throat> we went to John 12:12. 12, 12. Then we went to John 12, 24. Now let's double that one and go to John 12, 42. <clears throat> right? John 12, 12, we doubled it. John 12, 24. John 12, 24, we doubled it. <clears throat> just kidding, folks. <laughs> Verse 42, just trying to watch what's going on. and people going, uh, I don't do math very good. Well, apparently... Okay, verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. Now this is after he's made that statement. Chief rulers, many, believe on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogues for 
They love the praise of men more than the praise of God. All right. <clears throat> so we got followers. They are termed believers. Many of them believed. But my question is, what did they believe? Because Jesus stated in John 12, 24, I believe in life out of death. Amen? Amen. And I'm going to the cross to bring this about. <clears throat> These people, they were chief rulers, folks. They had worked the wisdom of the world. They had gained acceptance and beyond acceptance, esteem and position and titles and I'm sure with it money and all this kind of stuff. And they wanted to believe on Jesus, but they didn't want to believe in the cross. You understand what I mean by that? Or, or shall I say it like this? They didn't want to believe in Christ crucified. And one thing you have to remember at this point, he hadn't been crucified. <laughs> but they, they, didn't, they didn't hear what he had been saying. They hadn't been getting what he was saying. Jesus always knew that the power of God was found in selflessness, in loss to yourself so that someone else might gain. That somehow from that, if you exalt yourself, you're going to be brought down. Somehow just the exalting of yourself in, the, in God's realm of, of understanding brings you down. But if you humble yourself, he'll raise you up. Okay, But they didn't catch that. They didn't get that. And a lot of people, I'll just say it, a lot of people think that you can um, <clears throat> continue in the wisdom of this world while claiming to believe in Jesus. But one day there's going to come a confrontation. Now, <clears throat> nothing is, you know, I mean, the, the only thing Jesus says about their belief at this point, which is still good, it's really good, the next couple of verses, um, Jesus cried out and said, he that believeth, because remember it says many believed on him, and so he says, he that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me, and he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. In other words, it's not me, it's, it's the Father. Okay. So if nothing else, he's just trying to get them to believe, look, it's not about you. It's not about you becoming something. It's about another life in you. And for us, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay. So does it make sense that those words of Jesus would follow that right there when it says they believed on him and then Jesus immediately addresses the subject of belief and points it away from or at least unto uh, something that is eternal. <clears throat> All right, let's go back now to 1 Corinthians. I just felt like it'd be good to set that stage. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> now there's been this uh, situation in chapter 5 of, of uh, fornication, and he deals with it. Let's start at verse 3. Let's read 3, 4. And five. For I verily, as absent in my in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the of the Lord Jesus. All right. Now <clears throat> For some people, that sounds really out of whack with everything that Paul has shared in chapter 1, 2, 3, 4. But it's not at all. Because this, is, this statement and these three verses is another declaration of Paul's stand, number one, for Christ crucified and his belief 
that life doesn't come out of life. Life doesn't come out of greatness. Life doesn't come out of great ministry. Life doesn't come out of, of everybody loving you and accepting you and thinking you're something special. Life comes out of death. Okay? You agree with that? Yeah. Can you apply it when need be? Yeah. That's the question. Because here we have a situation where that needs to be applied. And, and his words are clear here, aren't they? I mean, <clears throat> uh, I'm telling you, basically, he says, to deliver such a one unto Satan. Well, we go, oh, my God, don't give him to Satan. Not Satan. How wicked are you? We should pray for him and get him in the arms of the dove. Or the sweet, pre you know, what is it? The sweet, precious Jesus, meek and mild, you know, <laughs> and get him, get him there. But Paul knows what he's talking about. You see, here's, here's the key. <laughs> he doesn't have a theological view of this. He has seen the Lord, number one, and number two, he knows that if everybody, I should not be an apostle. I am less than the least of all. I, I was the worst enemy of Jesus. And he touched my life and made me an apostle. And it, it shook Paul to, to his core. It did. I'm convinced of that. And so, I'll just read my notes. Paul believes in life out of death. The man is handed over to Satan, death, that his spirit might be saved, resurrection. You see it? He's doing this, you know, and, and folks, um, I think we have a really weird idea sometimes of, of death. I wish I could remember the exact example, but I heard one some time ago where somebody said, well, I'll just have to go into death over this situation. And, and I said, you mean where everybody will turn against you and they will uh, put stuff all over, your, all over the internet about you and they will, uh, they will see to it that your ministry is ruined and your money dries up and da 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 da. Well, they didn't mean that at all. That didn't, that was like, you know, I mean, they, you know, there's a concept of death, folks, that we can have that is simply like, well, uh, you know, something. I'm, I'm, I'm not ripping their face off. You know, I just die into my flesh by not ripping their face off. Is that really it, folks? Is that really all the death is? Is that we choose not to just slaughter our enemies? Jesus didn't say put up with them and be restrained. He said love them and die for them. And when they slap you, turn the other cheek. And he didn't mean go like this. Go, there, hit the other one. You know. And after that, that's two, and then you're mine, sucker. You know what I'm saying? Sorry for that Texas thing there. Yes? That's the death of the old man. Right. Versus we're talking about wanting to live by Christ crucified. That's right. And, and there is a difference. And I don't think we always, and here's the deal. It's not that we don't understand the cross or Christ crucified in a certain sense. But I would say that one of our greatest needs is to pray that God shows us um, how to apply this. Because if he doesn't do that, you're going to misread it. You're going to lay down your life, but you're not really going to be laying down your life. And then you're going to be all upset for what you gave up, you know, eventually, you know, because you'll get tired of holding your breath. <clears throat> all right. So. I'm just saying, you know, I'm saying don't do anything that I'm teaching ever. Get into the word and let God teach you. And if it's valid, he'll show you and then function by life and the life of it. But in the meantime, constantly be asking him, Lord, how does this apply? Because 
I'll be honest with you. When I first read this about, you know, well, I know what we ought to do here. We ought to just turn him over to Satan. <laughs> it's like, how can that be the Lord, you know? And here's, anybody hear what's rising when I say that? How can that be the Lord? That's not the Lord rising. That's, that's the offering mixed with honey in the Old Testament, you know? He said, don't put honey in the offering. <clears throat> but we're always putting in those human responses. Just give them Christ crucified. Just give them Christ crucified. Paul's looking at the situation. He hears from the Lord, and he says, look, death and resurrection is what's going to happen here. And, the, and death for Paul is he lost you know, out being a Pharisee. He lost out being uh, well-known and honored, and we'll get into all that, some other class and stuff like that. I mean, just like Jesus, he was God, and he became a man, and then he became servant, and then he became an object to be slapped and mocked. Death sounds more like being turned over to Satan. Thank you, my brother. Good to have you back. <laughs> um, very well said. Because the wording here is excellent. It, Turn them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Not for the destruction of the person. Not to destroy the person. Um, for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit might be saved. There's the resurrection. You see? <coughs> ah. Well, in Christianity today, there's a, there's a, a, a large group of people that, are, <coughs> that claim that they champion the subject of love, but they don't understand love as Christ crucified. They understand love as letting people off and being, you know, sweetie and all this kind of stuff. And sometimes you can't tell the difference by the way someone acts because someone might appear like that but it's Christ crucified you know <clears throat> um, so you know you, you can't judge anything before the time God has to show us everything and everyone that's why it's important not to know one another after the flesh even as wasn't to know Jesus after the flesh <clears throat> <clears throat> okay so um, uh, I I really want to get through this. So let's go to chapter 6 now. Like I told you, this class, I was just going to hit a couple of points along the way. Um, and I will say this, uh, as you're looking in chapter, towards chapter 6, Paul is doing this for the community, for the church, for the body. He's doing it for others. Does that sound familiar to Philippians 2 and the Christ crucified? Not for yourself, but for others. Okay, all right, let's go to chapter 6, and um, all right, what we're going to read here is we're going to read Paul's words. Uh, I think you'll do good if you don't think about applying this to yourself, because you'll get something, you'll get, you know. Now, it should apply to you, Shaban. It's the Bible. <clears throat> but I suggest, again, that you don't um, <clears throat> lend your being to New Creation Fellowship or Andy Nussbaum or anybody else or even Paul writing here but you ask God to make this real in you if this is true. Okay? It's real important. Because, all right. Chapter 6, verse 1. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know 
<clears throat> that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that ye shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have, uh, you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, do you set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church? I speak to your shame. It is so that there is not a, is it so that there's not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth the law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore, there, now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather allow yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, you do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. All right. Um, <clears throat> there's only one way to see this, and that's in the light of Christ crucified. Paul believes this stuff. Paul believes life comes out of death. He does. And, and, uh, and in believing that, <clears throat> you can read this and you can say, Paul appears insane to me. <laughs> okay? Because the wisdom of this world says this is at this cross that, that God would come down and with all of his power and everything give all that up and let us slap him around and mock him and beat him and hang him on a tree. And that's how he became Lord. God raised him and said, yeah, this is, this is the Messiah. This is the one, you know. And there understanding of that because they're so entrenched in the wisdom of this world is that's just stupid man if they slap me once I would wipe them out you know what I'm saying I mean I, I wouldn't put up with this and you know you get a lot of this kind of stuff down here in Texas <laughs> takes a lot of Jesus to convert a Texan <laughs> <clears throat> But I'm, I'm just telling you, I mean, it's like, you know, everything in your mind rebels against that because everything in your mind is the wisdom of the world. And there is, there, there's a lot of doctrinal teaching and there's a lot of stuff, but when push comes to shove, when it comes to a situation like this, well, that ain't fair, man. See, that ain't fair. I, you, you would never believe how much I, I've heard that phrase, that ain't fair. It, it's not. Christ crucified wasn't fair. wasn't about fair. It's about being one with the Lord. It's about comprehending the cross beyond uh, all the blessings that he did for us. And it's about obtaining life. And I wish I had time to get into all of that, but <clears throat> I will eventually. Someday, <laughs> if you hang around this place long enough. <clears throat> um, so, so I'm going to read my notes here again because we're already losing time here. <clears throat> um, to win the lawsuit is a defeat. Amen. In light of Christ crucified. Because he believes in life out of death. So he would lay down his life, let them win, even if they're wrong and deceitful and and a manipulative to the judge or the court or the da 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 whoever, you know, because he believes life comes out of death, okay? And he really believes that. And see, there's no need telling people to believe that unless you really believe that because it's dumb to tell someone to do that. That's why I'm, I'm more than ever tell you, don't do that. Don't do this right here unless you have the wisdom of God because it makes perfect sense when you have the wisdom of God. But it makes absolutely no sense and is just, just rubs you wrong. It's like, you know, going against the grain. <clears throat> All right. You think winning is winning. You think winning is winning, but winning is losing and losing is winning. <laughs> you like my statement there? <laughs> you think winning is winning, but winning is losing and losing is winning. At the cross, because there Jesus lost and yet gained the world. <clears throat> Why not go the way of Christ crucified and be defrauded so you can win? 
But you are the one doing the wrong and defrauding others by not living according to the cross or Christ crucified. You go against Christ who died for you. To, oh, sorry. To go against Christ who died for you is the greater sin. And I'll tell you, I'm going to go ahead and clue you right now, and I see it all the time in the New Testament. This little phrase, uh, Christ who died for you. Paul puts that, in, that little phrase in there, and that's part of what opened my eyes to this Christ crucified thing. Because he wasn't just talking about the raised Jesus or da-da-da-da. He's talking about a violation of the one that we're one with, Christ crucified. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Jesus does not retaliate from the cross lest he fail his mission. Do you even understand that living this way is your mission? Do you see your calling, brethren? How not many what? How not many? Or, or First Peter? You know, what it says. Do you see your calling, brethren? To be wrong is your opportunity to fellowship in his sufferings. And, you know, how many of us have read that in Philippians? And it says, I want to know him in the fellowship of his suffering. No, you don't. <laughs> Come on. You do not. These are the sufferings. You think it's somebody going, well, if you're a Christian, you know, I hate Christians. That ain't it. It's when those that are your own say, I hate you. And they put things on you that are not true of you. And you, you stand up and you love them anyway. <clears throat> Don't listen to me. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So to, to be wrong is your opportunity to fellowship in his sufferings, to be made conformable unto his death. <clears throat> um, so here in this story, you have the right to go to court. That's a legal right. That's a right of the republic, if you will. You have a right to go to court. Although, anybody seeing a pattern by me using the word although? Yes. Anybody, where, where might you have heard me use that before? It was the basis of my Philippians class. Although, you have the right, although you give up your right. He was God in the form of God, but he thought it not a thing to be grasped after, but became as a man. He had the right to be God, but he gave it up. You have the right to go to court. See, Paul is, is preaching Christ crucified here. You have the right to go to court, although give up your right. Become a servant instead of of proving them wrong and you right. Live by the life of the one who loved you and gave himself for you. <clears throat> um, Christ died for them, but you will not lay down your life for them. By this perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. By this perceive we the love of God in you too. Because you lay down your life for them. Amen. Okay? <clears throat> All right. So uh, now let's drop down to, well, verse uh, 19 and 20. <clears throat> Still chapter 6. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have of God, and you are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Okay, two main phrases in there. Well, several. Uh, don't you know that you're the temple of God who is in you, and you have that from God, so you're not your own. If that's who's in you, you're not your own. You're the temple. And you have this as your life, and you are not your own, therefore you don't act like you are your own. You have his life, and he gives up his own rights and all of that. All right. You're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Not just glorify God, hallelujah. You go to church and wave some hands and everybody goes, oh, I've had a great time glorifying God while I live for self the whole rest of the week. Woohoo! It's what a great God we serve. You know, no wonder everybody's so happy to have this God. All right, so to be bought with a price is to gain because we were saved by being bought with, we're redeemed, right? 
To be bought with a price is gain <clears throat> as a result of Christ's death. Christ crucified. He suffered. He died. We gained. Amen. He died for others. He, he suffered. He was, uh, his reputation was, everything about it was wrong for him, but he did it gladly for us so that we would gain. <clears throat> All right? So to be bought with a price is to gain as a result of Christ's death. But it is, no, it is also to no longer be your own. The same spirit in which you were bought, the spirit in which you were bought, selfless giving on the cross, you are now to live. Now the same selfless life that brought you out of bondage wants to live in you and die in you as to bring others out of their bondage through selfless giving. Does that make sense? This is what it means to confess the crucified as your Lord. One day we will return back to Philippians. And I'm really going to hit this point of Jesus being Lord. I mean, it's completely saturated in Christ crucified and has no other thought of exaltation other than what God exalts. And yet, that's who's exalted. He's made Lord. But what is exalted? Yes. Oh, well, I was thinking that you talked about that last week. We read in Matthew 5. Mm-hmm. And Jesus said, blessed are the poor at heart. So, you poor know, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about that as I'm talking to myself, mm -hmm. because I'm thinking the kingdom, what, what is their king? What governs them? It's the king of heaven. It's the things that are higher, right. you know, that... That's the poor, you know, blessed is, you know what I mean? I do. Well, and, that's, it, and that's exactly what I was referring to. I just didn't want to get into it all yeah. much now when I said Jesus is Lord. Because he's king and Lord and king. The same Jesus God hath made both Lord and king. And to, you don't mind me finishing off what you're no, saying? No, not at all. Because that's really good, and that is that, that is if this if this is the king, this is how he reigns. And anybody in a kingdom, they say, you know, well the the king reigns over us. Um, in a true kingdom, you know, I mean, like England isn't really a true kingdom in this. In the they'd probably kill me for that, but I mean, it's they're run by parliament primarily. Okay. The, the queen doesn't sit around and go, okay, well, everything will go this way and then shut up, Parliament. You know, no, they're, you know, they, they have a prime minister and all of that, which is the equivalent of a president. Mm -hmm. um, but a true monarchy, <clears throat> that king or queen, they make the rules, they set the stage, they, the, everything comes out from them. That's why it's called a monarchy, okay? And, uh, <clears throat> um, in the truest, because that's all a shadow, in the truest spirit of what Christ's kingdom represents, it is that the spirit and nature of the king reigns in us. Where is the kingdom of God? Within you. Well, how did it, okay, I'll get you in just a second. How does the kingdom, how's the kingdom of God, where is the kingdom of God? It's within you. Okay, now let's look within and see if we can see all of the buildings and the moat and the walls and the, the little spires, you know, that, that castles have, you know, there's the kingdom within us, right? We got, I mean, is that what it is? Is that the kingdom? <laughs> you know, I mean, but a kingdom, if you thought about like in the Renaissance or whatever, you know, it was a, it was a wall, and everybody lived inside of there, and they had little buildings with those cute little spires that are, you know, on all that kind of stuff. On, and, okay, the kingdom of God is within you. Well, everybody knows that, but when they say the kingdom of God is within you, they don't picture that, so what do you picture? Well, I don't know. 
I don't know what that means. Well, it means the king is reigning within you. You know? The kingdom has come. And when the kingdom comes, his will is done. You know? <clears throat> so that's, excuse me if I went, got a little carried away there. But, <laughs> but I really, I have been, you know, for, it's been a good while, but he keeps, he won't let me up on this thing about the Lordship of Christ. In fact, one of the books I checked on there was because I just wanted to see, is this, you know, is this going to match up? Um, all right. Uh, we're starting to get low on time here, so let's go to chapter 7. And um, if you are single, unmarried, you may leave the room now. Because <clears throat> we're going to be talking about conjugal rights. <clears throat> <laughs> no, we're not. We're going to be talking about Christ crucified. <clears throat> okay? Uh, chapter 7, ver well, let's just start at verse 1. <clears throat> now, concerning the things about which you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Never nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife her due, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one, one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Okay. I hope that incontinency isn't what I think it is, but... No, I, I know it's not. Sorry. Did you wet the bed again, honey? <clears throat> um, okay, this, like verse 3, let the husband render unto the wife her due, and likewise, okay, well, I'm not sure what her due is here, but I'm embarrassing myself. I'm thinking of something I shouldn't say. Why do you do that? <clears throat> All right, basically, this, this is the same Christ crucified, folks. It is. It's the same Christ crucified. Paul, you can't rip the guy away from the subject. Because why? Because, you know, because all these subjects are coming at him and they're different and they're a variety. Because this guy already stated up front, I am determined not to know anything among you but Christ and him crucified. You know, well, there are other things in the Bible. What, other than Jesus? I mean, do you, are you really interested in those things? You know, and in Paul's case, other than, in Paul's mind, there are no other things but Christ and him crucified. Now, I, you know, now we're going to get into like chapter 8 and chapter 9 and chapter 10 and well, uh, 11 and 12, Lord willing, um, 13, 14. If we get into all of those folks, that is a, an incredible variety of stuff with different issues and whatever. And yet, every one of them. For Paul is Christ crucified. But I ask you, how many of us have read through those and never seen Christ crucified? How many of us might have assumed by not seeing Christ crucified that it really there's really just a variety of subjects and Paul in 1 Corinthians primarily really deals with Christ crucified in the first and second, maybe a little in the third chapter. But after that, it's just a bunch of stuff, issues. And so you can't really push this cross thing, this Christ crucified thing so much, you know, because there's a whole bunch of the Bible where you never even see the words Christ crucified. And yet, you take a template, you know, 
You know, if that template had a cross on here, you take that and you lay it over that, and there it is. Oh, my God, there it is. And you go over that chapter. Oh, my gosh, there it is. That's what he's saying. That's the basis of his judgment in this situation. So you go to another one. That's, I'm just telling you what's happened to me. And you go there and you go, oh, my God, this is it. This is the template to know all things. We know all things by Christ. We know all things by Christ crucified. I say, I had a couple of hands and I never meant to, to skip anybody. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've had that said to me before. The temple things, what I was going to say, but what I point out to them is what do you do when Jesus himself says, unless you take up your cross and bear it, you cannot be my disciple? I mean, what do you do with that? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, this is that really an issue. Huh. I just wrote that word although on the board <clears throat> because um, it's not always written, um, but It is understood so many times. And this in the last chapter in chapter six, although you know, you are or you have the right to go to court. Although you have the right to go to court, you choose not to and be defrauded because you believe in Christ and Him crucified. Anybody following that? All right. <clears throat> You have the right to withhold sex from your partner. Although you have that right, you choose not because you're not your own. Is that? Yes. All the guys are going, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's not always that direction. <clears throat> All right. So putting the needs of others before your own, although you have power to withhold for reasons, maybe even religious reasons, um, do so only with consent. Um, which I thought was interesting. Because he said even for prayer and fact, you know, but do this by consent. In other words, you're not your own. Remember, that's, that was uh, uh, how he ended the last chapter, that you're not your own. And you see, Paul is like a, um, Paul, I, you know, this is so funny to me, but I see Paul like going through these different subjects. So he's like walking through chapter one and two and three, and he's like got this certain piece, the, the negative side or the positive side of Velcro. And he's walking through it and all, as he walks through it, these things are just sticking to him and he never lets them go. He never forgets that you're not your own over here in chapter 6, so we apply that over here in chapter 7. Does that make sense? We forget that stuff. We can hear it in that one class, the beginning, and then at the end go, well, what, what about this? You go, well, although this is, you know. <clears throat> and, uh, so it's just, uh, uh, man, I, I would, you know, I would recommend this to everybody, that... You ask the Lord to begin to uh, make you a Velcro being where you, this stuff sticks. When you hear it, it sticks. And you don't have to have it retaught every week or, or you know, reminded that, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. We're not our own, so I shouldn't be, you know. now. That, but it's like, well, I left chapter 6. So that's over with. No, it's not. Can't get an amen on that. <laughs> Did I see somebody's hand? I thought somebody raised their hand. Yes. Oh, that was you. We're out of time. Okay. She raised her hand. Hallelujah. Okay, that's it. Take a break. <laughs> it's bossing me around up there. <laughs>